welcome to Out of the Box Radio with me, your host, Christine Blasdale. Out of the Box Radio is a weekly podcast of audible ear candy dedicated to bringing a fresh perspective on this thing that we call life. And each and every week, we're going to be diving into the topics that matter most with lively conversations on issues such as health, wellness, and transformational healing, all with the goal of creating a better world and becoming a happier human being. I will be your tour guide for this epic adventure, and each and every week we're going to be embarking on a journey with the ultimate goal being transformation to our highest potential. And now, let's get out of the box. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Out of the Box Radio. I am your host, Christine Blasdale, and you are set for a very exciting hour this hour because we are going to be talking about all things love. What does that mean? What happens to our bodies and our brains when we are magically in struck by that Cupid arrow, so to speak, and in love? And uh, since Valentine's Day was just recently, I want to invite to the show right now Professor Dawn Maslar, a love biologist, and she has studied the neuroscience of what's not only behind Valentine's Day, but what it means when you fall in love. She's also the author of the book, Men Chase, Women Choose, The Neuroscience of Meeting, Dating, Losing Your Mind, and Finding True Love. And she has also given um, an incredible um, presentation on the, she's done a TEDx, she's been a TEDx speaker on how your brain falls in love. I'm very excited to have to the program Professor Dawn Maslar. Welcome to Out of the Box Radio, Dawn. Oh, thank you for having me. So I, I, well, I love this subject matter because I am currently madly in love with the love of my life. And so I, I am very interested in finding out the, the neuroscience behind it, because we know kind of how we feel when we fall in love. The, the Maybe some people have a little bit of the butterflies and, and all of that. But it, apparently, there's a lot that goes on in our, not only in our bodies, but also in our minds when we fall in love. Let's talk about that. The neuroscience of it being in love. How did you get involved in the subject matter? First of all, I'm, I'm dying to know. Oh, boy. Um, because my love life was dismal. I had a, <laughs> I was one of those people that was attracted to the wrong men. I was chasing after this bad boy biker in the band. So I'm like teaching <laughs> at school during the day and following them around at night. And then when he asked somebody else to marry him, I knew I was not, I was striking out. I wasn't doing very well. So. Um, I, after I did that, I, I started to look at me and, uh, I worked on myself and I wrote my first book, which was, uh, the broken picker fixer. And then I started this woman's group and we started doing these kind of, uh, classes and they kept asking these questions like, how long do you wait? How do you know if it's love? What is love really like? And all this these questions kept coming up and I was like, well, you know, I, I work at a university. I, I have access to all the peer reviewed literature. I can figure this stuff out. I'll get back with you. Well, it took me five years because it turns out that love's not just one thing. And it took five years to kind of piece all the research together to really get a comprehensive view of what happens when you fall in love or what love really is, how it works. Okay. So first of all, Let's talk about um, let's talk about this. What happens when what happens when we meet somebody and my goodness, maybe we have this feeling like we've known them before or we just start getting those googly feelings. What what are those little butterflies? What are those little things in your tummy? Is that saying, oh, no, <laughs> oh, oh, get ready? <laughs> uh, well, it could. It could, um, especially if you have a history of dysfunction in your family, but because uh, often we're attracted to the what's called the opposite and familiar. So a combination, and sometimes the familiar can be uh, negative family traits, but that's a whole other thing. What causes those butterflies is norepinephrine, which is a fight-or-flight response. So it's kind of wild. The feelings that you get when you first meet someone that you, fe- that you think is attractive, it's kind of lustful, is the same physiological response is, is if a mad gunman ran into the room. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
<laughs> and in some relationship somewhere down the right the, the road, it might feel like that. <laughs> right, right. It, so the and actually, the more scared you are, the more heightened the response is. Uh, there's there's okay. actually called misattribution of attraction, where fear can uh, feel like you're attracted to somebody. Really. So, Yes, yes. They did a study and they put these guys on these rickety bridge and they found that the guys that were on the really scary bridge were the ones that were most attracted to the uh, female attendant. So um, it's where the misattribution and attraction is what they termed it. But it's also the, do you remember the tunnel of love rides? Yes. That's the whole concept behind that is you go into a tunnel, it's dark, you get a little scared and you come out the other end in love. Because you get scared. Oh, oh, I thought, yeah, that was a clever little way to get close to somebody. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, in your, in your book, um, Men Chase, Women Choose, The Neuroscience of Meeting, Dating, Losing Your Mind, and Finding True Love. Great subtitle, by the way. Um, <laughs> explain a little bit more. And now, in our audience, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about all kinds of relationships this hour. We're going to be talking about same-sex uh, relationships to men and men, uh, men and women, um, uh, women and women. But in this dynamic on, in the book, th- what do you mean men chase Women choose. I I find that that title very intriguing. Um, let's talk about that. Do do men love differently than women? Well, we fall in love differently. Mm. We when we once we fall in love, it's pretty much the same. But how we get to falling in love can be different. Mm. But the what the name stems from. I'm a biologist, so there's a biological uh, principle that states that the sex that takes the biggest risk. In most species, that's the female. There's some species like the sea, uh, seahorse um, where the males carry the young. And so he takes a bigger risk and he's more discerning. But the sex that takes the biggest risk is more discerning and is pursued by the sex that takes the least amount of risk. That makes sense. So that in, in humans, it's men chase, women choose. Right, right. And um, and so there is so there is a science behind these things that we kind of just, I guess, take for granted. Um, let's talk about just that initial meeting and scientifically what happens. Are there are there pheromones involved? Does, this, does that have anything to do with um, how we find somebody attractive? Absolutely. So when the. When you first meet somebody, your senses kick in and your senses actually determine if you're attracted to someone or not. Your, your eyes, we all are familiar with the eyes, but we've all been there probably before where we see a picture of somebody. Like if you're dating online, you're like, wow, I really like them. Then you go meet them in person and that whole feeling that you had disappears because those those other senses kick in. So one of the main ones is your nose, which really kind of sounds counterintuitive to a lot of people, but your nose picks up a variety of different things. For women in particular, the nose picks up what is called major histocompatibility complex. You, we are most attracted to someone with the opposite immune system. It picks up a uh, element of the white blood cells. So genetically, we, we prefer the opposite. Um, we also will pick up, uh, if it, for a heterosexual relationship, uh, women will look for a metabolite of testosterone. Mm-hmm. Um, and for men, they're going to be attracted to women. Uh, they can pick up a pheromone during her time of ovulation called a copulin. So he's going to be most attractive during peak, op- peak fertilization time. This is fascinating to me. Now, um, now you really, I mean, and when we say that you are, you know, a, a love biologist, you, I mean, you walk the walk and talk the talk. It's my understanding that have you, is this true? You, um, well, and scientists do this, that you actually, you cut up a brain and showed what love does to the brain? Well, yeah, it was a jello brain. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. Okay. <laughs> But but um yeah let's t- let's talk about what yeah what happens in what, what goes on in the brain cuz well let me ask you a question real quick yeah how long have you been in love you said in the beginning you were in love uh it's been uh just over a year 
Oh, okay. So you are definitely in the insane part. Yeah. <laughs> in the in so, the in the so beautifully ins- probably, insane part. Yeah. Yeah. So the good part is, um, don't take any major exams right now for another year or so. Um, it's you actually lose research found that you lose cognitive ability when you fall in love. <laughs> we, we we go down a little bit in the brain department. We, exactly. We're not making you, the you, best decisions. <laughs> you you have a deactivation of your prefrontal cortex. So yeah, your executive functioning is not so great. <laughs> <laughs> And what else? What else happens? Well, then you lose a part of your brain called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that judges the other person. That's why they say love is blind, because you really can't see him or her for who they really are at the moment. Your friends can. Your friends are going, why are you? What? Hey, did you notice that? And you're like, no, isn't? Aren't they wonderful? And um, that's because you can't really see them. There'll be a couple more years before you can really see them. And the, and the weird part is even if you did notice something, you, there's a part of your brain called the amygdala that sounds the alarm, and that's deactivated. So even if you notice something, it doesn't register as being a problem. <laughs> so you're basically flying blind. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You're flying blind. Now, there was um, uh, one of the other things that I had read on here, too, was – um, there's an increase in self transcendence. Now that I, I love this. What, let's talk about that. Um, what is self transcendence and what is that increase? How does, how does that happen? Well, if it may be better if I put it a different way, there's a decrease in selfishness. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you're more likely to put the other person first and, and look at a more global, um, you know, relationship globally as opposed to like me, 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 me. And that's part of the parietal lobe, which is deactivates when we fall in love. It's, it, it actually, we see part of um, the similar activity in, um, I think it was like cloister nuns or something that they did some research with when they do like long-term meditation, that, that transcendence, that like that decrease of self, you become more selfless. Right. And and out of curiosity too, because I've just noticed this. I mean, this is just personal. But does, when you when you first fall in love too, is there? Do, I I know that in the initial initial phases, you know, you're you're concerned about how you look and how you look to the other person. But um, is there this thing like you get lo- like love chub? Like, is anybody else like like just loves to eat and drink? And <laughs> is there something that happens chemically where? where you become hungry or maybe we think we're pregnant. I don't know, but, or is it just me? Um, I don't know. I'd have to really look into that part. Um, well, we've got to research that do, Dr. Don. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you do get, you do definitely get more comfortable. We've got uh, a bunch of other stuff that's going on. Cause you're, you've got like a neurotransmitter upheaval, but usually you don't, you don't, that makes sense now that I think about it because um, it depends on how you respond to the cortisol. Your cortisol is your stress hormone, which increases, which seems counterintuitive. You think you're like, oh, I'm in so in love and everything's relaxed, but your cortisol actually skyrockets. So if you're a stress eater, that would make sense that you would put on weight. Um, me, on the other hand, I'm one of those people that doesn't eat as much during stress. So I tend to lose weight. Mm. So it, it it all depends on how how the person responds to that. So the cortisol level rises. Mm-hmm. So in many ways it is it, in many ways it's stressful on us when we fall in love. Absolutely, absolutely, and and it's, it's all of one of the reasons why it doesn't last. It can't last forever because it that suppresses your immune system. Well, and I mean, you can love an, a person for a very long time, but that in love, um, I guess that that. Well, I, I don't know. I would hope. I would hope that you know that feeling of being in love could could last you know a lifetime with somebody. But if it's triggering, I can see how those cortisol levels would be raised if being with another person, especially very intimately like that, um, that it would trigger old fears, um, uh, maybe fears of anything. Anything related to the heart, uh, old heartaches, heartbreaks, uh, 
um, abandonment issues or things like that, whatever happened as maybe as a child, the child parent relationship or or uh, in a previous relationship, if you apply that to another person getting close to your heart, does that have something to do with it as well? There's like maybe a triggering. Yes. Ah. Yeah, it's, no, it's a trick. Um, in it, it, yes and no. It doesn't happen. Yes. And yes, it will come. So that parietal lobe, and you've also got some loss. Uh, uh, I, I just lost it. I'm sorry. Um, but I must be falling in love. Um, just kidding. <laughs> <Aww. laughs> the temporal lobe, that's the one I'm looking for. The temporal lobe. Um, you do lose, when you when that, that transcendence part, you actually lose some of those, I don't want to say lose, but they're temporarily shelved old memories. You know, all that old stuff, that selfishness, that self-concern becomes temporarily sell, shelved, but it will come back. So later on, hopefully you're in a loving relationship. Now that stuff comes back to be dealt with. And, ah, yes. To finally <laughs> be dealt with. And um, and if you have a loving, um, patient, kind partner, they will um, ho- hopefully help you through that. Right, because they love you. Correct. And then that's where the whole, like, you move from the falling in love part is the crazy brain part. And then you move into another phase of true love. And this is actually a more wholesome uh Love. It's it, it, it. This love shares neural connections with morals, ethics. It's a it's a higher type of love, uh, un, uh, unconditional mm. love, brotherly love. So it's a uh, it's not as crazy anymore, and it's warmer and it's more nurturing. And we see when we see you first falling in love, we see activation of part of the brain uh, or activity similar to as we see when you take cocaine. It's so like when you first fall in love, it's like this like really giddy, high kind of love. And then later on after the, the – it's usually one to three years, we see neural activity in the area of the brain that has opioid receptors. So it's more like a uh, uh, nurturing, pain-relieving, actually a very soft – uh, warm kind of love. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, if you can think of falling in love as like using cocaine and staying in love is like using heroin. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I love the analogies. <laughs> so, um, so I, I'm wondering too, if, cause you've studied the brains so much, is there a difference and what, what would be the difference on someone who is, let's say, let's say you looked at my brain and mm-hmm. and and I, you either showed me pictures of of the love of my life or she's sitting in the room next to me holding my hand would my brain look different to, uh, would it look different under a microscope or whatever uh, instrument you use compared to someone who let's say is is um is not in love is just you know by themselves they're 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 single they're, they're relatively happy you know uh, but they're yes. they're by themselves and um and living life uh, as a single human being would my brain look different um than theirs yes so we would see a de- th- some of those areas i talked about the ventral medial prefrontal cortex the amygdala we would see a deactivation so we see less blood flow into those areas the parietal lobe parts of the temporal lobe so we can kind of see that, yeah, that you should, this person is in love. And then later on, we see the, the irony is that we see less activity in the prefrontal cortex, but then later on, that's where the activity moves into when you stay in love. Now, once you get into the in love phase, that becomes more um, non-resistant to stress. So stress can actually sever your connection to love because stress is in the middle part of the brain and it has a way to hijack the rest of the brain, hijack the prefrontal cortex, and that's where we see the love later. So it, 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 as you continue on in the relationship, you have to really guard against the effects of stress in later love. Right. And does, does that... Um, having that unconditional bond, that love, that true love, um, 
for a long time, does that help when you are in situations of stress? When I mean, because sometimes stress, we, we have no control over it. You know, something happens, we lose, a, we lose a, a parent or there's a, you know, we have an accident or something traumatic happens to us. Does that help in, in that yes. process? Ah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Being in love really helps that. But it all depends. It really, it kind of goes back to like the old cliches about it really depends on what you think of. So if you start focusing on the negative, if you start focusing on the stress, then it's the love won't the love won't win out, you know, or may not win out because you're focusing so heavily. But if you're in a relationship, we know particularly for men, uh, loving, helpful relationship, at least for heterosexual men, uh, we know that the heterosexual men will live. Um, or, or heterosexual women will live 50, 50% longer than her single female, and heterosexual men will live 250% what? longer. Yeah. Wait, say that again. <laughs> say that again. Heterosexual women will live 50% longer than their single counterparts, where heterosexual men in a loving relationship will live 250% longer than their single counterparts. Well, so guys got to get like, just get on, get going so they can live longer. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> now, um, there's something about this hormone of happiness. It's, is that the serotonin? Yes. Okay. Now, um, what happens when, when, when we're in love to, um, to the serotonin or let's say maybe maybe even past that falling in love stage. Does that right. stay relatively, the, the hormone of happiness, does that does that have an, a, an effect on us? It does have an effect. So what do you think, up or down? Well, I would think that serotonin would probably, especially in the beginning, would would go, would go I would think it would go up. Yeah, um, you, most people say they, it goes up. It, it actually doesn't. It goes down. It's counterintuitive. So serotonin goes down. Yes, it drops to the level of someone with OCD, obsessive compulsive oh, geez. disorder. Oh, Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's why you're so That's obsessed. That's why you're so nervous. First... Ah, and you're so obsessed. That's why you're checking their social media, and they're wondering where they are. <laughs> no, you, I'm kidding. And, and you get on the phone with them, and you're like, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. Yeah. Nobody. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. We're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> now there's something also about um in a in a heterosexual relationship with so there's a, a male partner and a female partner this is interesting um apparently his testosterone drops yes his um, a man's testosterone drops when he commits to a woman interesting in, in the in, in the in, in when they interesting part is when a woman falls in love hers goes up so you often see the two people in a heterosexual relationship, they'll say words like, we f we're so much alike. Well, yeah, because they have been kind of like they're, <laughs> they're meeting in the middle. Mm. And hers goes up, so then that also um, increases her, her, yeah. her sexuality, right? Her Exactly. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But that's only in heterosexual relationships in homosexual relationships with men his testosterone does not drop well there you go there you go that makes a lot of sense but in in i'll say with 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 uh, women and women i i will say that they both go up yay <laughs> 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 or at least i feel like that um well, uh, yeah i think they do uh, but then of course they'll level back out later yeah shush 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 Professor Don. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, we just had Valentine's Day, and of course, uh, everybody's, you know, there's there's the, the cards and the, and the candy and the chocolate and the flowers and all those beautiful things. But there is something, um, there's something very interesting, and I love the history. And you, you being the love biologist, you will know this, and I'd love to have you share this with the audience. Let's talk about the, um, the origi origi origination of of Valentine's Day, and in particular, we we equate that too with uh, this little guy named Cupid, and um, and Cupid and his little arrow. Can you talk a little bit about that? About the beginning of Valentine's Day? I love this. I love this this history. No, well, no, well, no, it wasn't. 
it's actually not Cupid. It's Valentine himself. Oh, it's is it Saint Valentine? Yeah, it's Saint Valentine. Oh, well, where did Cupid come from? I that was know. just the not... that was probably the greeting card people <laughs> like they did with Santa Claus, right? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I yeah. have to look into that. But so, so who was Valentine? How... Who was Valentine? Valentine was a uh, he was part of the clergy. So there was Emperor Claudius II who he decreed that no soldier should get married, which makes biological sense. I'm sure he didn't understand it at the time. But as I said, when a man gets commits to a woman, his testosterone drops. So if you're trying to take over Europe, you need as much testosterone out on the field as possible. So you got, you, I'm, it makes sense that you would preclude them from getting married. But Valentine came around behind his back and was marrying these soldiers. And they caught him, and they put him in prison, and they declared that they were going to put him to death. Oh. Yes. He was a martyr. So the, 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 the story behind the Valentine is that he was friends with the jailer's daughter, and right, they be, had started a friendship, and one day she came to go visit him, and he wasn't there, and he had left a note. And the note was he had gone, they had put him to death. And the note was that, you know, just remember that you're beautiful and that you are loved. And that became the first Valentine. Oh, my gosh. What a tragic story behind it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It is kind of. So that was the first Valentine. That was the first. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh my. And he became a saint because he was a martyr because he was put to death. Right, right. And uh, wow, that's that's wild. The the um, and so also part of the whole Valentine's, uh, you know, the, the I I love Valentine's Day. It is my, you know, it's one of my favorite days. But it's not just about you know giving gifts and things like that. I love it because um, it it means it means love and not just romantic love either. You know, it's a celebration of love. Um, love for our parents, love for our planet, love for our friends, all those things. Although we've we've equated it to a romantic or sexual love, right? You know, right, that, right. that kind of thing, relationships. But um, there is something uh, to be said about one of the things that is very big on Valentine's Day, and that's the giving of, of chocolate. And mm-hmm. that also has an effect on us, doesn't it not? Yes. Good old chocolate. So, right. So dopamine is the hormone of pleasure Mm. or the neurotransmitter of pleasure and chocolate has been found to increase dopamine. You can actually put a piece of chocolate in your mouth and as it's sitting there, your dopamine will increase. And the, the interesting part is that strawberries also increase dopamine. So one of the big things now is chocolate covered strawberries. So you kind of get like a double, double bang for the buck on of dopamine on that one. Oh, I didn't know strawberries do that as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's smart. And that's and why you have the, the chocolate-dipped strawberries, and they're tasty. Right. And the, the funny part is, remember when you were a kid and you would give out candy to, because they used to have it like your secret admirer, so you would give out like candy to people to let them know that you're interested? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, those little candies are pretty much pure sugar. Well, it turns out when you are in love things taste sweeter thereby giving something sweet to somebody can invoke the thoughts of love oh it's just that's ply them with sugar <laughs> exactly <laughs> so so you're already crazy you're all hopped up on your hormones you're all crazy got like obsessive compulsive well, no, disorder this is, this, is befo- this is before oh this, this is, is before. before this is when you're plying them to to, to pay attention right. to you well, yeah right yeah. in the beginning right in the beginning when you're sending them the valentine do you remember i don't yeah. know I, when i was in school we had to um in elementary school we had to give valentines. We they, you did. We'd have to give valentines to all of our classmates, right? Right. And that yes. meant like your all you know your friends, and then the 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 ones that you had little kind of crushes on. And I always would save the best card. I would because they were all the same. I mean, you'd have like four of the same cards, and you know, but you'd have like ten or you know, I don't know, maybe ten different sets. And, mm-hmm. and I would go through them and I would try and find the coolest one. And that was going to be from my my special Valentine, right? And I'd have special hearts on it and everything like that. But 
that was like a real, that was really funny because that was something I, that was a real treasured memory um, that everybody got. I like that, that everybody got a Valentine card, Valentine's Day card, even the nerdy kids, the kids that were like, you know, nobody was really hanging out with. Everybody right. got one. Do you have fond memories of, of Valentine's Day when, especially when you were younger? Yeah, I used to love that too. It's like everybody was included. So I remember walking home with um, cardboard hearts and Valentines and, you know, just kind of beaming with like just happiness because you got, you, you know, you had all this love that was kind of going around the school at the time. Now, um, I'm wondering what is the, okay, so you have, again, you have studied a, um, a lot of the biology or the science, the neuroscience of, mm-hmm. of falling in love, losing your mind, um, <laughs> uh, the, all of the different hormonal aspects. Are, is there research that you um, haven't been able to do yet, but you're, you're wanting to do that you're looking forward to be doing? What do you, what else, in other words, when it comes to this, in your field, what um, what's on the horizon for you or that you'd be interested in taking a look at? Well, there's something I'm actually kind of working on. Um, there is a, actually, uh, I have a patent pending on a product to, and this is for more, for heterosexual love, but it, we could use it on a man to determine if he is in love and committed to a woman. So it's basically a saliva test that will indicate if he's in love and committed to a woman. That's brilliant. (laughs) Do they have to know that they're getting tested? Um, Probably at the way it's looking, unless he like falls asleep with his mouth. (laughs) And he's drooling. (laughs) I can just see millions of women collecting the drool. (laughs) So you, so you, is that possible? Really? Yes. Yes. It's in the saliva? Yes. If somebody's committed? Yes. But again, it's only heterosexual men, so I can't tell on anybody else, women or anything else, just on Why men. is that? It's mother nature. I you know, I just found the pattern and then I we're working That is on brilliant. It. <laughs> Professor Don Maslar. The, the, what is, we're going to come up with some names. We're going to come up with some kind of clever little names for that. That would be amazing. Oh my gosh, that would be, um, yeah, you would have to probably do that, um, probably have to do that when they're, when they're laying there sleeping and drooling and just collect it because they may not like want to subject themselves to that. We called it the devotion test, but I, I was toying with the name of reassure her because basically. Oh, I love that. Yeah. (laughs) That's brilliant. When, you know, you're after a while you're in a relationship, sometimes it kind of goes stale, you drift apart. You know, you the love is still there, but sometimes she could use some reassurance. So you can use the test to go, look, see, I'm still in love. I you know, you're still the one. I only have eyes for you. He's not, you know, I'm not cheating. Right. That's 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 cute. And that's cute. Then there's that's um that's a nice little I like the title too. Go for it. All right, thank you. Patent that puppy and 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 <laughs> put it on Shark <laughs> Tank. <laughs> now, um, I, I'm wondering. Okay, so now we know about what happens to the brain when we fall in love and everything's beautiful and kissy kissy, and all of that crazy stuff too. The the little bit of you losing your mind uh, during the process. But have you studied when it when it goes a sour, when it goes, you know, the other way? Like let's say if somebody does uh um, you know, cheat on their spouse or um does does something that, you know, that that breaks that love uh that love bond with another person. What about what happens to the brain when that happens? Um well it will, it can, when you're in love, you're, it's, you're in that, it's a transitory state. So if there's something that occurs, then it can create, you're, you're kind of almost like slamming your car in, in park, you know, you're like, you, so you've got this upheaval that you've, it's already occurred. So the serotonin level, you become obsessed, 
You can go into depression because the serotonin level is so low. Um, so those are the type of things that can happen. Your cortisol levels high already, so you're a nervous wreck. Parts of your brain are deactivated, so you, you know you're going. They're just so wonderful. You can't see straight. You can't see that um, th- that they had faults, that they had problems. Um, so there's a there's a that's if it happens when you first fall in love. Yes. Later on, um, it is not as it is not as uh, it doesn't appear as, to be as much of a problem to the brain, but you do go through something called a, being a broken heart, and it actually the research shows that it can actually give the same feeling of having a broken heart, of of of, of literally like having a broken heart. So um, it 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 causes um, great deal of pain and there has there's uh research that shows that oftentimes like when a spouse dies you'll see another spouse if they've been in a long-term relationship die not yeah. long after that yeah and it's that's the broken-hearted syndrome isn't that um yeah isn't that powerful uh, that's mm-hmm. a powerful thought that when you I, i've i've heard that many many times um mm-hmm. And especially, and maybe it's not true, but I I think what I've heard is that, uh, let's say in an, in a long term heterosexual marriage, the couple have been together for you know uh, almost all their lives, right? Mm-hmm. When um, when the wife dies, the the husband will follow like very quickly, mm-hmm. and yet and yet in not all cases, obviously, but then. Um, I've heard though when the husband dies that the that the wife can actually can live a lot longer and I'm I'm I just know because I know of a lot of women in my life are extremely strong I mean they've been through all kinds of stuff right and um, have been able to weather a lot of, of things in their life and carry a lot of a, a large load of um, oh, disappointments and and all and hopes and dreams but also they've had a a little bit of rough hits here and there. Um, Is there a difference, do you think, in the way that that women are able to survive heartbreak as opposed to to men? Is is there any science on that? Well, yeah, there is that. Estrogen is actually protective of the heart. Mm. So for, for the majority of a woman's life, she has... A better heart, basically, than a male. A testosterone beats up a heart a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So one of the reasons why women tend to live long, even though she may go through a broken-hearted uh, period, that but her heart is, is able to weather the storm a little bit more than a man. But also, I think it's because too, we we know it's society. It's a norm for the man to die first. So I don't think. It's it's more expected, so it's not as much of a shock, and it, I don't think we, women uh, are better prepared for that, mm-hmm. as opposed to a man. Oftentimes, a man in a long term relationship, his he's used to being taken care of, not being you know. So his his uh, his loss of his spouse creates a lot more hardship for him. Um, mm-hmm. In some ways. Women, the women are going. Wow, I've got I've got some free time here. I, it's, I've got me time. Right, <laughs> time to get the motor home going. <laughs> Gonna go for <laughs> right, right. No, it's um, it does mix. It just depends on the roles, I guess, and the roles being in your relationship or in your marriage, and that I would say that would probably apply to um, heterosexual marriage and also same sex marriage, just depending on. On, on, because there is that you can have two caregivers. Of course, you care. You both care for each other, but there might be a little bit of a of of roles in that relationship, um, on on the way that that people interact with each other. Uh, um, I was wondering, does does age have a difference? In other words, if we are twenty four years old and we fall madly in love with someone, and uh, go through the process of 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 getting to know them better 
and um, maybe living together or marrying that person, does that brain look any different than someone who's, let's say, um, you know, in their 50s or 60s and um, and they fall in love with someone? Is there any difference or is it the same chemical reaction? Uh, the good news is you can fall in love several times in your lifetime yeah. and it looks the same. It, it does. doesn't matter. Yeah. So we still have all that crazy stuff going on in our in our in our, in our brains. Exactly. It's the eighty year old crazy guy, you know. Yeah. Compared to the eighteen year old. Same crazy, same exact stuff that's going on. Although the eighty year old's testosterone probably doesn't drop as dramatically because it's probably already low. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well and I want yeah, and and um, I I want to let our listeners know too that um, the beautiful part about is that is that um, yeah you never know when you will um, meet that special person. I myself am I'm 53, and um, I have I have found the absolute love of my life, my best friend, um, that person that you know that if I, if I wrote a letter to God like a like an order like a order form, and I mm-hmm. said. I'd like this quality, I want this, this, you know, like a checklist, right? A checklist of all the little things. I would like this, 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 this. Um, th- this this human being, you know, has all of those wonderful qualities. And I'm just now experiencing, and I've never, um, I'm 53, I've never been married. I'm planning on getting married in just a very short time. And, um, and so I want to let people know, too, that it's never too late. My grandmother was 80. Five, I believe she had been married. She had been married a couple times, not to the love of her lives, like like not to the love of her life, right? Um, mm-hmm. Back in those days, you married, you married somebody. You either you got pregnant, and you got married, or you married them because they were, you know, it was for security, things like that. But she, at the age of eighty-five, reconnected with a um, a gentleman who was like 90 and they had met each other when she was married. And I guess they were like in their thirties and they both were married to different people and they had worked together and they had there, there was something, they had this connection, but they never acted on it. Right. Cause they were married mm-hmm. to other people, but they, they just, they were, they had such a great connection. And so years and years and years and years and years later, they actually um, met up again. Uh, both of their spouses had had passed, had died, and they ended up for a good, I think, good four or five years, um, being madly in love with each other. And, oh, that's awesome! Yeah, madly, madly in love with each other, <laughs> and and traveling. And I've never seen my grandmother so giddy, and silly, and happy. Oh. Oh, I love it. So there is absolutely love it. That's what I that's what I want to tell people too that that you know, love is true. Love is not just for the young. Um it's Mm-mm. it's it really isn't and I think it's keeping yourself open um and uh open to that to the possibility and lo and behold, you know, hopefully it doesn't take anybody everybody till they're 80 in their 80s, but it can happen. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it yeah, you can love you can fall in love over and over and over again. So, I mean, fall in love is just a transient state. And, and in being in love and practicing, see, love, that transient state where you feel giddy and you fall in love, it's wonderful. But then you get a another love. But this type of love, it, it turns from, there's a meme that says, love is, starts as a feeling and begins as a practice. And that's basically what we see in science, that you got the feeling, and then it turns into a practice. You really start practicing love, being loving. Um, and then once you do that, then your brain fills with these good feeling, um, heart protective, uh, those, those opioid type of um, neurotransmitters gush through your brain and that's where you get this nice warm like it's kind of like a in the beginning it starts off like a roaring fire and then later on it's like those warm coals Mm. smothering coals Mm -hmm. 
And I love what you said. It's there, and there is there's a difference between falling in love and practicing love. Mm-hmm. Um, because also, you know, anybody that's been in a relationship, you know, that it's not all going to be flowers and candy and um, and and good times. That is that practicing of love um, or being love is is really being love and being love. If it's unconditional love, if it's supportive love, it's through all those ups and downs that that we have. Um, I, I that's that's a subject matter that I really um, I just adore because I think we're not taught as a society um, we're not taught how to love. Mm-mm. We're taught what? We're, oh my gosh! They got tutorials on how to how to look sexy to you know how to attract someone to land them, yeah, to land them. But there, we don't teach we don't teach young people. We don't teach people. We don't teach our um, our children on how to love or how to practice love. And I think. That's really what's what's missing so much from our society. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I agree. I agree. We spend a lot of time on like how to get the relationship and then then it's just assumed that once you got it, it's going to last forever. And of course, now we know it doesn't. You know, all fairy tales end with they write off into the sunset. Well, what happens the next day when he's got morning breath? You know, Mm -hmm. how is how are they dealing with that? They don't tell us that. And it's really important. One of the things I found for um, the thir- fourth phase, which is true love, is that there's three important neurotransmitters involved for the practice of love. And they did some research to find out what was the thing that all long-term relationships had in common. And they only found one thing, and that was the ability to maintain positive illusions of the other. In other words, it's what you really focus on that maintains the relationship. You want to focus on the negative, it's going to it's going to sever the relationship. But if you keep looking at the bright side, at the good part that you like in that person, that's why memory is important. Taking pictures are important. Celebrating Valentine's Day is important because you keep re- you keep remembering bringing up the things you liked about them. The other thing that's important is maintaining that dopamine that we talked about earlier. So like, you talked about giving chocolates and stuff, which is nice. But one of the best ways to do it is doing new and novel things together. So like when your grandmother's traveling and doing all these new stuff, yeah. she's just she she's just go, you know gorge with dopamine because she's just having a blast so when you do new and fun things with your person whoever it is um that really helps increase that dopamine and keeps the love alive that's what keeps passion alive if you don't do that the passion dies you you become roommates Mm -hmm. you know that the dead the bed death the yeah exactly exactly well, and and um, and I think so much of that is um, is also realizing that that no one is perfect, that you are not mm-hmm. going to, um, you know, I'm getting I'm getting set to marry um, the most wonderful person I've ever met uh, uh, again, but I know that she's not perfect. I right. love the fact that she's not perfect, and I know that I'm not perfect. Um, there is a um, I think there was a neurobiologist that once said, um, just so you know, and it was a family like a relationship therapist type type person. <clears throat> I love this is he said basically that everyone you that, that that as far as being in a relationship with anyone, that everyone is a pain in the ass. And then he said, including you. Yes. So when you realize that, that, you know, um, that you know, not not everyone is perfect, and we do have these idealized version visions of, you know, the, the knight in the shiny armor or the you know the the perfect human being. There is no such thing as a perfect human being, and I think that the healthiest, longest, wonderful, lasting relationships are those in which you're able to be yourself. You're able to be your most you know your your imperfect self, always trying maybe to improve things but you there is an acceptance of each other that you're not perfect and it's how you bounce back from 
adversity or from, let's say you have an argument over, you know, you left the toothpaste cap off again uh, or, you know, I didn't sleep last night because you snored or you, you know, did this. It's how we, it's how we bounce back from those little tiffs and, and arguments that we have. That's the thing. It's how two cup how couples fight and how they, uh, and how they come back from that or how they argue right. and how they come back. Cause some people, and to, so I've heard some couples, they, man, they argue like, you know, they're both pulling out their full arsenal um, yes. and want to, wanting to hurt the other person. I still think that's maybe protecting, they're trying to do some kind of self protection. Yep. Um, but we really need to also, that goes into teaching people how to love. It's when you, if you could teach children on how to love, and how to practice love, you can also teach them um, how to deal with when you have conflict, mm-hmm. right? So, so what happens when you first fall and when you first fall in love? All that crazy parts of the brain, your <sighs> natural defenses decrease. So you're basically super vulnerable to the other person, and it's okay because you're the part of your brain that should be concerned that you're vulnerable is not activated. But what happens in about two years, all of a sudden, those natural defenses come back. You, critical judgment returns. You start noticing all that stuff that was like, oh, it was slightly annoying but cute, now becomes really annoying. Now it's grating, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes the thing that really brought you together that you thought was like the most adorable becomes the most annoying thing ever. You're like, oh, you yeah. Know, <laughs> I, it's it's in the beginning. It's like, oh, I love her independence. She's so independent and so on yeah. her own. And then later on, she's never home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. The yeah. very things that they fall in love with you for the beginning. They're the things that just. Uh. Oh, Professor Don Masler, I want to thank you so very much for joining us on Out of the Box Radio this week. Do you have a website or anything that you'd like to let people know how they can get in touch with you? Yes, it's Dawn Masler, M-A-S-L-A-R, uh, DawnMasler.com is my website on Facebook as Dawn Masler and Instagram and Twitter. So, you know, follow me or be my friend or whatever. And um, and they can out. also they can also check out your um, your TED Talk, right, on, on how your brain falls in love. Yes, I have actually have two. The other TED Talk didn't come out as well. They had an audio problem, but there's actually two TED Talks out there. And then um, the keep an eye out for the test coming up. Oh yeah, what are we gonna what, what are you gonna call it? Reassure her, reassure her. Uh, reassure her. That's that's one, one possibility. The, yeah, one possibility. All right, it's gonna it's gonna be a hit. I'm gonna tell you <laughs> it's gonna be a hit. <laughs> um, also, Thank Professor you. Don Masler. She is also the author of the book "Men Chase, Women Choose: The Neuroscience of Meeting, Dating, Losing Your Mind, and Finding True Love." Thank you again so very much, Professor Maslar, for joining us today. Um, Thank you for uh, having me. Talking about all things love, not just the, not just about the candy and the and the gooey stuff, but the actual brain, what goes on, how crazy we get. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And I want to thank you, listeners, for tuning in this week. Remember that you can uh, never, ever, ever miss an episode of Out of the Box Radio. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or iHeartRadio or the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is wonderful because then you can uh, easily send and share the videos of these interviews out to your friends and family. And this is one that you definitely want to share with as many folks as you can. Until next week, I want to remind you to always think outside of the box. Bye for now.